Hey, welcome everyone. I'm Jeff Crispo, Vice Chancellor of Education here at UNSW, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all here to the second in our series of the inaugural Centre uh, 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 Education Academy Fellows Lecture Series. And tonight we're going to hear from Richard Buckland. I do need to let everyone know that uh, tonight's proceedings will be recorded, uh, so there's little notice as you uh, came in, and it's part of a documentary series uh, that's being uh, Richard is uh, involved in, in his role as the coordinator for first year experience. So I just wanted to also uh, remind everyone why we actually have this lecture series. So this lecture series is from all of the Centre Education Fellows. At the end of last year, uh, we set up the Centre Education Academy, and we did that to acknowledge the outstanding educators that we have here at UNSW. It was a way for us to say to people who have spent their careers uh, enhancing the student experience, enhancing student outcomes, and it was our way of saying to them, we acknowledge the work that you have done. Not only the work you've done, but also the impact that you've had on your colleagues. And so I'm very pleased that we've been able to do this here at UNSW. So tonight, we're going to hear from Professor Richard Buckland. And I probably shouldn't actually call it a lecture, should I, Richard? It's actually a conversation with Richard, as you saw from the title. Um, but just to give you a bit of background uh, about Richard, Richard is well known here at UNSW, uh, both for his work as in cybersecurity, uh, because he's a professor in, in uh, computer science, in computer security, cybercrime, and cyber terror. Uh, but also, he has made a tremendous effort around the student experience. And that's also what Richard is well known for. And uh, last year, uh, Richard also took on the role of director of first year experience. And I'm particularly pleased to be able to work with Richard in that capacity uh, in his role as the director for the first year experience. Uh, Richard has degrees in science and economics. Uh, he's also been awarded the University Medal in Computer Science, the Vice Chancellor's Award for Teaching Excellence, twice. Um, he's also received various awards from external organisations such as the Australian College of Educators, uh, the Australian Association for Engineering Education, and of course the Australian Learning and Teaching Council. So Richard is well known in the sector as well, not just inside UNSW, but more widely, both nationally and internationally, for the work that he's done. And when we talk about people who actually have a passion for the student experience, I think Richard probably epitomises that, because that word passion is really the thing that actually drives Richard and the work that he does with students. So tonight, we're going to hear from Richard in terms of a conversation um, around, and I think you've seen the uh, diagram that we've got here, and uh, Richard, I guess that's really typical of you as well, to give us a visual uh, metaphor for the things you're going to talk about tonight. And so it's the bit over on the left-hand side there. So Richard, please come and have a conversation with us. Thanks, Jeff. That was a lovely intro. Um, I'm really pleased everyone's come, and I'm actually quite touched. So thank you, everyone, who's come. I know this is a hard time. Um, it's conference time, and it's also end of exam time, and really, you shouldn't be here. So what are you doing? <laughs> Take a good, hard look at yourself. But um, so it is advertised as a conversation. Um, uh, I've in, done my normal trick of planning to say too much. Um, so I hope it's not too one-sided a conversation. At the end, I'm hoping we'll have time for questions and answers. I have chatted with some of you who are here, um, who came early, and one person in particular, Mark, is that, where are you, Mark? Why are you at me? Ah, at the back. Mark's from Wollongong. Are oh, you all isolated? You should come and join our family. We love to have you here. Thank you for travelling all this way. Uh, and I wanted to repeat to you, Mark, but also to everyone else, that if I don't talk about tonight what you were hoping I would talk about, or, oh, hello, Alex. Uh, um, or there are other things um, that you want to talk, then please feel free just to contact me afterwards and we can have a real conversation that way. I'm very happy to do that. And by afterwards, I don't mean immediately after the talk because I'm a bit jet-lagged because I've been in America. Uh, I mean, some other time. Uh, but some other time soon. I'd love to do that, and particularly uh, with Mark. So, um, 
what I'm hoping to talk about tonight is a defense of teaching. So I'm hoping to talk about teaching rather than about the act of teaching. I'm, I want to reflect on what teaching actually is, what it means to teach. And it's a funny thing. So it's a, a very personal reflection. So please forgive any subjective bits. Um, so I want, first of all, I want to think about this thing that we call teaching. Three things about it, I think, are sort of obvious to anyone that thinks about it briefly. One is that it's very important. Teachings are an incredibly important thing because um, I think teaching is sort of the oxygen in, um, in the engine room of civilization. It drives everything. So when I was watching with horror the results on Trump or the results on Brexit as they were coming through live, you could watch the things um, coming through. The BBC for the Brexit result gave us a really nice infographic which was dynamically updated, which showed um, proportions voting for Brexit and against it, broken down by level of education. Um, it, it was a crude demographic thing, uh, you know, highest level attained, averaged over an area. And it was so clear that that was the biggest predictor of how people were going to vote. A better predictor than income, a better predict predictor than social status, uh, social class, class status, which is a big thing in England, and a bit bigger predictor than uh, which party, you know, your political alignment was your level of education. And we saw the same thing with Trump. That, again, the best predictor for who was going to vote for Trump versus against Trump, demographically, was to do with the level of education in the area. I, I think that education is what makes us us, is what makes people people, is why we're all sitting now in suits, dominating the planet or in clothes, up comfortably here, not fending for ourselves and gathering food, and all the other animals are out there, if they're not extinct already, they're working hard and they're cold and they're shivering, except cats who have dominated us, of course. The, really, the rise of our species um, is not because we can run faster or because we're taller or more ferocious or have better claws or any, any sort of physical attributes like that. It's to do with our ability to think, to learn things, to work things out, and then, so we don't have to start from scratch, to pass them on. So the chart of humanity, really, if you could chart it in some sense, seems to me this upward rising thing as we build on what's happened before with drops, the fall of the Roman Empire and drops, and they're interesting and we'll look at those catastrophes soon. But, um, but there's this sense in which passing things on, we make things better for the next generation. And I think that is the essence of humanity. That's the core. That's so important. So I used to, in my early life, do another job. And that job was uh, a well-paid job, but it was a job where probably the only good thing you could say about it was that it was a well-paid job. And when I experienced teaching, I suddenly thought, well, firstly, it's not a well-paid job. But... <laughs> But secondly, it was just so clear to me that it was an important job. In fact, in, I couldn't think of a more important job. I suddenly thought, this is more important than medicine. This is more, from my point of view, for me, it was the most important thing I could do in the world was to be a teacher. Um, so, so talking about teaching, A, it's important. B, it's unpopular. It's so strange. When I started at university, it was already starting to become unpopular in Britain. And I used to be smug talking to fellow PhDs in, uh, from British universities because they were talking about how teaching was being less valued and how they were being pushed to do research and research was becoming just paper generating and, and, and they were sort of scornful. And I used to say to them, ha-ha, in Australia we value teaching and we value research. Um, and that was a foolish thing to say. Uh, and then I've watched 20 years of that, of me being demonstrated to be a liar. Um, that increasingly... Um, over time, more and more of the conversation at universities, not, at this, not just at this university and not particularly at this university, but at all universities in Australia and certainly overseas, has been focused more and more on research. And teaching has become, from my point of view, a slightly apologetic thing that we do. And I've noticed interesting trends. Um, that um, I had a friend who was nominated for the Vice Chancellor's Teaching Award at another university, not this university, another national university, in fact. Um, and th the head of the department called her in and said, I'm concerned um, about your career. I hear you've been nominated for a teaching award. <laughs> and there is a sense amongst academics 
that, um, that we feel, rightly or wrongly, that teachers are sort of viewed as second class almost in the university. Not at UNSW anymore, I hope. That seems to be changing vigorously and with passion from the top. Um, what if I get it? But, yeah, yeah. So it's very interesting. Um, I, I've, uh, that we've created teaching focused roles. It's a terrible name, but it's essentially a role that we want to have where teachers, where academics can be teachers and be, can be recognised for being teachers and have a special path for being teachers and have a community of teachers. And all these good things associated with it, but in many institutions we've brought in, they have brought in education focused role and it's been a, a place where you put the less good people or the people who aren't predict doing, you know, who aren't going to go so well. And my dean mailed me today and said, I'm going to announce all the people who are doing education focused roles, do you mind if I mention your name? And I assume he mentioned it to everyone. That was a very polite and appropriate thing to do. But it's also very telling of the time that many people would be frightened for other people to know that they had selected to spend their time teaching um, because it would seem that you'd be saying, I'm not very good or I've given up on life or something like that. <laughs> and that is very strange. Um, it's also unpopular in a different way. There's an increasing focus on education now, uh, and rightly so, because the government funds education, it doesn't really fund research, and universities um, are very cleverly uh, across the world have taken the education money and used it for research, um, and that's, you know, that's just normal at all universities, and governments are sort of waking up to that, and the, I think things will change for one reason or another. Um, so there is an increasing focus on education at universities, but it's on education, um, not on teaching. Teaching's sort of still a bad word, and people will say, we're all about education, but we're not about teaching. And absolutely, we're about education, because education's the thing we want to work. It's the curve that makes things rise. Teaching's just you know, one of the mechanisms we use to carry out education. But I think it's a really important mechanism, and I, I want to just talk about teaching, just teaching tonight, um, because I think we shouldn't be ashamed of being teachers, we should be proud of being teachers and society should support and rejoice in teaching and we should think about teaching. So tonight, just teaching, not education. Um, uh, and the last thing uh, to say about teaching, which I'm sure is evident to every single person in this room, is, oh, I remember you, hello. Hi, Greg or Craig? Tibor. Tibor, that's right, all right. <laughs> no, I, rem I remember you from the security talk. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's very similar. Yeah. <laughs> Well, because you were such a rascal in that, you kept calling out. You haven't called out yet, are you saving it up? <laughs> I'm going to just stand over on this side. Um, that I don't think we do teaching very well. Um, and I'll, I'll talk more about that later on, but let me, I, I'm sure, does everyone agree with that or is it, do I need to elaborate on that? Certainly the students here are all nodding, so I don't think that. Um, can I just... Let me just say a couple of little bits of evidence of that. And by we, I don't mean UNSW in particular. I think UNSW actually does a better job than um, many, if not most, other institutions I know about. But even at UNSW, everywhere, I think we don't do teaching well. So a typical thing that I would notice is when I interview students, and I interview lots of students, I would say more than 100 students every year, um, and I ask them about their courses, the typical breakdown I get is they have one course that they think is taught well, of the four they're doing at the moment. They have, some people are lucky and have two and some people have none. They have one or two courses that are okay, that are taught in an okay way, and they have one or two courses which are taught poorly. And yes, yes. Um, and, and if you're a student here now, would that summarize your current enrollment? Yes, okay. So. This is a worldwide thing. I was just in America, and while I was in America, I was doing my normal trick of interviewing students, because I just can't stop talking to students and asking them stuff. And I interviewed students from Brazil, from various colleges in America, rich ones and poor ones, some people from Berkeley. I, I, oh, actually, I don't know if I interviewed any students from Berkeley. I interviewed a teacher from Berkeley. I interviewed a whole range of students, and they were all saying the same pattern, that essentially, at the moment, they all had one course that was okay, a couple of courses, one course that was good, a couple that were okay, and a couple that were terrible. That's really shocking to me. Um, and I think probably the last thing to say about that, and then I'll, I'll go through the talk, is years ago at um, a university, a long, long ago at a university far, far away, I was 
interviewing a student, a girl that I'd been tracking for a while, interviewing her since she was in primary school through high school. She'd love maths in primary school in grade six. She still had an interest in maths through high school and she'd gone to university and was doing a technical degree. And I was interviewing her every six months or a bit less frequently just to see how her attitudes toward maths were changing as she was getting older. And I was particularly interested in what the teachers were doing and how it was going. And she was in first semester at university um, and I asked her how it was going and she said, terrible, she's not gonna do any more maths. And she described what was happening in this class. And it was a very large class, thousands of people, or more than a thousand people. And the, essentially the lecturer was lazy, scornful. I don't know what it was, that there was something wrong with this lecturer and their approach to teaching. And they were creating hostility with the students. They weren't teaching well. They were um, making the class distressed and nervous and unhappy. They didn't transmit love or care or anything at all. And they were hostile and it was, it, the students all felt the lecturer didn't want to be there. The lecturer didn't want them to be there. It was, all, it was just horrible. And the girl said, I'm not going to do any more. And I thought, I have to do something about this. So I actually went up to the dean at that University of Science. And I said, I just want to let you know. I'm not trying to, you know, cause any trouble or anything. I just want you to know, because I think it's a serious problem, that the way this current course is being taught, this very large course, is putting off students. They're reporting, and I mentioned a couple of behaviours, and th this is a really serious problem. You're not going to get graduates, you're not going to get postgraduate students out of this, you're not going to have happy students, you're going to lose your students. This is a really serious problem. Someone is teaching this course essentially that doesn't care about the course. And the dean said, oh no, that's terrible. And then the next year I was interviewing another one of my students who was, another one of my subjects who was going through that thing, and it was the same story, and asked the name of the lecturer, it was the same lecturer. So for me, that sort of summarised everything. That there can be a course looking after your future intake of students, the first course they do, with more than a thousand people taking it, and you've got someone who doesn't care and is doing a terrible job running that course, and you find out about it, and that person still does it next year. For me, that communicates so many messages at so many levels about how important teaching is seen. Um, I, don't think, I can't think of any business that would survive if they did that. I can't think of any other you know, it just, I was, I, I actually couldn't express how I feel about that. But for me, that was shocking, is probably the word to say. So, they're the three obvious things to say about teaching. Now, th they were a bit negative, weren't they? Well, the first one was good. Now, let me say some more positive things. Um, I want to talk about blue. Uh, a couple of months ago, earlier this year, I was actually going blind. I couldn't see. For a couple of years, if you've ever seen me walking around and I haven't smiled at you, it's not that I don't like you. Or it might not be that I don't like you. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's probably that I couldn't see you because the world was just disappearing for me, even with my bottle cap thick glasses, plus 100 or something. Uh, and there was something wrong with my lenses, and they took the lenses of my eyes out and put new ones in, and now I can see again. Uh, not fantastically, but back to the old self. Um, now, they took one out one week, uh, one lens out one week and put a, a, a plastic one in, I assume, and then one out the next week. So I had one week with a old new, and that week was probably the most amazing week of my life. Uh, and I almost asked not to put the other one in because I could answer that question, that age-old question that I'm sure you've all thought about when you're a young teenager. When I see red, am I seeing the same red that you're seeing? You know, does red to me mean red to you? Well, I, the answer to that is no. It's not the same. Because when I woke up that morning and I took the eye patch off, I had to leave it on for a while, and then I was finally allowed to take it off one morning, I looked, I walked around to the house, there was no movement in the house, I took the eye patch off, half expecting Triffids to have taken over the world, and there was all this blue light, it was five o'clock in the morning, all this blue light pouring in through one of the windows. I thought, what's happened? Have the builders next door, this building next door, they put up a big blue wall and the moonlight's reflecting off it. Or is there a blue spotlight outside? Are the police outside? What's going on? And I looked outside and just everything was blue. It was amazing. And then I covered one eye, the good eye, the new eye, and everything was just normal. It was sort of yellow and murky and gungy. And then I took the other eye, whoa, blue. And I just, for a while, kept going. The blue was so beautiful. I had done a colorblind test just before the operation. I could see blue already. I could see blue. I'm seeing blue. It's blue. It's fine. But it's, it's a sort of murky color, I now realize. This is blue. I don't know if I've ever seen blue before that, like this blue. 
I actually cried before my family came around. I just sat there looking at the sky, seeing this blue. If you're wearing blue tonight, I love you. Blue's my favorite <laughs> color now. Blue is the most amazing color in the world. Once they did the other eye, it sort of faded a bit because I don't have the comparison anymore. So now I just see it as blue. I used to be able to cover, look with the bad eye and go, yeah, that's blue, that's definitely blue, that's, that's blue. And I go, oh, that's blue. So um, it wasn't that I wasn't seeing, I was seeing something that I called was blue, but it was giving rise to a different sensation. The reason I want to talk about that is it's such a subjective thing. You cannot express this to anyone else. I couldn't describe to you what blue was and you know which of those two blues I'm seeing. I don't know which of those two blues you're seeing or if you're seeing an even better blue, maybe. But once you've experienced it, if you can compare the two, it's something that can't be expressed in words but is clearly a truth. For me, that's what real teaching is like. When you experience real teaching, you go, and crap teaching, just, you can never put up with it again. But if you've gone through your whole life never having real teaching, you, you are just going to teach that same way yourself, and you have no expectations, probably, that it could be or should be anything different or better, and no words can really describe it. It's not something you can do on a checklist. Oh, you give students power, or you give them, a, you know. You can, it's, it's just this thing. If you've ever had an inspirational teacher or someone that's changed your life, You'll know this thing. All our teachers should be like that. All our teachers can be like that. It's not hard to be like that. It's just a different way of thinking. So perhaps I should say all our teaching should be like that. So that's blue. For me, that was the most amazing uh, experience. Oh, I don't know what that is. Um, a song. I want to I play you a song, just a fragment of a song, and see if you can guess what song it is. This is for the oldies. all my careful preparation and planning, I didn't have the volume up. I've actually got audio that you should be able to hear. We'll try again. Put up, don't say it, but who knows the song? Yes, one. Yes, or two. All right. Try a bit more. Who knows the song? Yeah, more people. What is it? Allentown by Billy Joel. I've been, what's that? I said we're all. <laughs> we're awesome. Um, the last week I've been over in Allentown, USA. Allentown's an interesting place. It's in Pennsylvania. Uh, well, here, well, the lyrics of the song. Well, we're living here in Allentown, and they're closing all the factories down. Out in Bethlehem, they're killing time filling out forms, standing in line. Allentown's in the Rust Belt of the US. The Rust Belt's an interesting thing. I've since being there, think it's the most important thing in the world to understand the Rust Belt. The way five years ago or 10 years ago, I felt it was the most important thing in the world to understand why the Roman Empire didn't survive. What, what is it about something that seems that it should last forever that it, it doesn't? What's the problem? What's the flaw? Bethlehem Steel in Allentown, was, uh, this, uh, the suburb's called, or well, a small area, I'm not actually sure how they classify their areas, but it's either a suburb of Allentown or an adjacent town or something, it's called Bethlehem. A company formed there, it's Bethlehem Steel. They, at their heyday, employed 300,000 people. They, in the Second World War, the head of Bethlehem Steel promised the president one new complete battleship every day of the war, and he exceeded that. They were the biggest manufacturer of shipping, I think, in the world, or perhaps in America, the second biggest steel company in America. They made billions of dollars. Their steel is used in the Empire State Building, in all the bridges you've heard of, in the Hoover Dam. They were just massive. They were famous, they were huge in Allentown, Bethlehem, that's where they started. That's where their world headquarters was. I saw the building, it's still there, it's huge. They were unbelievably profitable and wealthy. They put a lot of their money into building a huge research establishment on the top of a mountain, and that's where this conference I was at was at, and it was just so luxurious. And the uni has now taken it over, and it's just the best space for doing research and stuff. It's amazing. They had so much money. They were 
like the Titanic, they were unsinkable. They were just unthinkable that anything could happen to this company. The most, one of the largest companies in America. Here's the factory. They've left um, bits of the factory still there. They haven't torn them down. Um, here's some of the, the uh, it's all rusting now. I can't express how big they are. You can walk up right next to it. I couldn't get the scale in, but you know, a person's about that big. This, this thing is just vast. It's like one of those huge ships you see docked at Sydney Harbour, the passenger ships. It's like that, but it's docked in the middle of the town. It's just all rusting. You can see there's plants growing all over it now. Um, rusting away. There it is, reaching up to the sky. Story after story after story with plants all over it. Well, we're waiting here in Allentown for the Pennsylvania we never found, for the promises our teachers gave, if we worked hard, if we behaved. So the graduations hang on the wall, but they never really helped us at all. Now, they never taught us what was real, iron and coal and chromium steel. And we're waiting here in Allentown. It's actually, I keep humming that song the whole time I was there. I don't know if that's what all visitors do. I thought it was probably rude to say it out loud, um, but I'd be going, hmm, hmm, hmm. Uh, so I did start asking people um, and interviewing them about the crisis because I was just so interested in it. And I found a lot of people who were old town residents. Uh, more than half the town moved away when the whole thing shut down. Um, one old guy I was talking to said lots of his friends or their fathers committed suicide. He said he knew three people who had committed suicide. Um, families broke up, families moved away, lives were ruined and shattered, and no one expected it would happen. And I said, why, why, why? Why did this thing that was so big and powerful what happened to it? How can it suddenly not be there anymore? And he said, well, we didn't know. And everyone has different reasons. So here's what I've gleaned so far. Small little companies were popping up all over the place making steel, and Allentown laughed at them. You know, they made that thin steel that you put trash cans out of and things like that. And Allentown, they thought no one, Bethlehem thought, no one, that, they can't compete with us. We make, they invented eye girders, eye beams. That was, that's from Bethlehem Steel. Um, the foreign stuff got cheaper and um, things could be made overseas. Demand sort of dropped. Other countries started making it. Other states in the US started making it. And the board was not open to new ideas. So when new things kept coming, new ways of making things, continuous casting, new strategies, new methods, they'd say, no, we'll just keep doing what we're doing. We're really good at it. We're big. We're unstoppable. I'm still f trying to find out, to understand how it can go from billions of dollars to nothing. But here's what I think. I think this is universities. We employ more than 300,000 people. It's unthinkable we could disappear. But I reckon in 20 years' time, there'll be these old rusty buildings all around the place and people will be going, and that was a what? A university? I think if it won't happen, at least it's a possibility that it might happen and we need to think about it. I think what they did wrong was they sort of felt they were invulnerable and they didn't have to listen and they didn't have to change and they didn't have to adapt and they were disrupted, and they were disrupted like with a hammer, like newspapers, television stations, Harvey Norman, video stores, all the other things of my childhood that have just disappeared, that we thought would never disappear. So, if universities, I believe, keep going and not listening, if we have a chairman of the board who's sort of arrogant and thinks we don't have to watch what's happening with upstarts and small nimble things and people without a lot of overhead and people without massive capital they've got to support and, and, and we just keep doing the things the way we've always done them, I, I sort of think we're in danger. And I think the way we've always done them is this. I think, I don't know, I'm just making this up, but if we go back a bazillion years ago or 10,000 years or something, probably how people were taught was their parents taught and showed them stuff. And probably they were in small communities and there were wise people that showed you things. And maybe there was a wise lady you'd go to and she'd show you where to plant. There was some, teaching was sort of like that, I imagine. But with the industrial age, we ne people needed to know stuff, if you think of the Industrial Revolution. And how we did it was a bit like the Industrial Revolution. So we've got classes where we all sit in rows like a conveyor belt and everything's rectangular and lined up. Everyone's got little square tables. And then lockstep, like a production line, today we're doing chapter seven turn the page and we all do the process and it's just the right speed for some kids and it's too slow for some and it's in the wrong direction for others and so on. We've got this big industrial model. An industrial model makes sense because it's efficient and you can do large scale things really cheaply and efficiently. And it makes sense, we all learn lockstep, we all teach lockstep, students have the same thing happening to them lockstep. And for everything to work, like for a factory to work or for Woolies to sell products and things like that, all our apples have to be standard size and everything has to be standardized and things. This, this. So, 
we need people to be compliant, we need students to shut up in the lecture, we need to have quiet, we need to do control, we need to do all that sort of stuff to let the mechanics of teaching work so we can have our factories of teaching going on. But I think these new nimble things that are possible now, these little offshore things and small companies popping up over America making things that look laughable at the moment, their little trash can MOOCs and things that look silly to us big powerful unis, those little things, they're just gonna keep getting better and better like the other people did. And they don't have to make everything go lockstep and have all this infrastructure. So I sort of think, okay, I'm not expressing it well. I think what we need to survive, what institutions need to survive, and what teaching needs to survive is to one realization only. That education is a human endeavor. That our students are human beings, that teachers and our colleagues are human beings, and we're humans interacting with humans. And that needs love and care and non-standardized things, and it needs not to be a factory approach, it needs a caring sort of approach. And it sounds sort of crazy, but I think we only had the factory thing because it worked, not because it was the best way of doing it. And we've all grown up seeing that color blue. We've all grown up thinking that's how teaching works that everyone shuts up when the teacher talks, that everyone does homework at night, which is that we have these things called textbooks. Uh, you know, it's just a mechanic that we're used to and we're sort of replicating ourselves unthinkingly. So I think to survive, learning and teaching is ultimately a human thing. And you can squash the humanity down to make the factory work and you get something that's okay, it's still blue. But it's better if it's different for every person and if everyone reaches their full potential and if there's care and relationship between the teachers and students. And that means it's harder to do it like a factory, but if we could work out a way of doing that, it's actually better. There's nothing particularly blessed or coming down from Mosul in, in, in tablets about our old way of doing it. It was just convenient for the large factories. But in the past, this way of teaching, if you've done any economics, teaching in this industrial factory-like way is a monopoly. And what a monopoly means is you don't have any choice. So you just have to put up with it and do it. Because you've just got, normally, one provider and you can't do anything else. Well, we've got multiple providers. The monopoly here is the method of teaching. You could leave this uni and go to that uni and it's all the same. But as soon as you break a monopoly and you allow competition in, so as soon as people start teaching in different ways, once people start having MOOCs and constructivist MOOCs and caring small private colleges and one-on-one -on -one tutoring and companies start doing in-house teaching instead of requiring degrees and apprenticeship models and all, all these crazy new ideas that are popping up now, it's no longer a monopoly. When you've got a monopoly, you can charge monopoly profits. Monopoly profits for universities basically mean we don't have to do much work, we don't have to teach you well, because there's no, op it's the old thing about the bear, you know, you're being chased by a bear with a friend. You know this one? Yeah, uh, tell us. Two people in the woods, there's a bear, and the guy goes, oh, let's just get running, let's running. And um, I think uh, one goes, why are you running? We're going to you know, get eaten. He goes, I don't have to outrun the bear, I just have to outrun you. Yeah, that's right. One of them stops to put on sneakers, and the other guy says, why are you putting on sneakers? Even with sneakers, you can't outrun a bear, they're really fast. And he says, I don't have to outrun the bear, I just have to outrun you. So the idea is, with a monopoly, everyone's doing the same thing. We don't, but once some people start doing good stuff, then you can't have these monopoly profits or behaviours anymore. You actually have to start doing good stuff. So I think humanity is a thing. Um, I wanted to, I don't know how I'm going for time. Is anyone looking at a clock? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is a perfect segue into... <laughs> yeah. Here's a human thing. Here's a baby learning to walk.
I hope you didn't mind showing everyone that Vivian. <laughs> um, so, learning to walk isn't a fact in a multiple choice test. It's not something you get in a 10 week semester or a course. Learning to walk is you being changed in some way. What we should be doing as teachers, what education's about, is changing people. How did that change happen? Well, one thing that helped us was the humanity of the whole situation. That baby wanted to learn. It was programmed to learn. It fell over. It couldn't learn day after day after day. It couldn't walk, but it didn't give up. It kept trying to walk. No matter what setbacks it had, no matter what the difficulties were, it was yearning for that goal. Motivation, a human thing. You have to want to learn to learn. It's very hard to learn something if you're indifferent to it. The people around it were encouraging, they were loving, they were caring. It was all about humanity. That child might have learned to walk in a factory setting in one of our classes. We might have walk 1001 where you enroll and you get homework and there's multiple choice tests and maybe at the end you can learn to walk. But I bet you wouldn't learn to walk as well or as fast or as happily or as successfully or as efficiently as if caring human beings surround you and you long to walk than if someone made you walk. If you think about it, it's quite scary to stand up here, perched on these two little things with our most precious thing really high up with a center of gravity above ground level. As you, you know, yeah, okay. So, almost there. Interviews. If I reflect back on my own teaching practice, there's really just one thing I did early on by sheer luck that led me to falling in love with teaching and adopting the approach to teaching that I adopt. And for those that came in late, this talk is about it's about teaching. I'm not going to talk about teaching tips. It's just about what it is to be a teacher and what it is for society to have teachers. The one thing I did, so this is almost a teaching tip, if you're a teacher and you, you wanted to have a good idea. The one thing I did was I was teaching some primary school students mathematics. And then I, with the school associated with that school, I went to the high school and I started teaching some of the high school students mathematics. And I, would say, just give me the brightest, the students that love maths the most, the ones that are really switched on and on fire and perhaps not being stimulated at school. Give me them, give me a class of six to eight to them, and once a week I'll spend an hour with them and we'll do something awesome. I did it for grade six, and I did it for grade seven, I did it for grade eight, grade nine, grade 10, grade 11, and grade 12. Grade 12 was the hardest, because they were serious about the HSC. So there I am at this school, having seven or eight classes a week, and it suddenly struck me one day that the year six class was largely girls. And the year seven class had a few more boys in it that had been selected for me, people that were really switched on about maths. And the year eight class had more boys in it. And the year nine class, it was sort of 50, 50 boy girls. And the year 10 class, it was mainly boys. And the year 11 and 12 classes, it was only boys that I'd been doing. And I thought, wow, what changed in the water over the last three years? There's some new chemical being added that's making people's brains different depending on their gender or something like that. And I just thought, what's going on here? Because I could see that I was probably seeing a steady state. I don't think I was seeing an anomaly. I think those year six girls that I was seeing would get to year nine and half of them wouldn't be there anymore. And there'd be half the boys would be there. Now maybe boys are late developing. You know, there's a whole lot of range of reasons. It wasn't the lack of boys that was interesting to me. It was the lack of girls. It's what happened. I, these girls were on fire in grade six. They were amazing. But by grade 12, none of them would be identifying as liking maths or good at maths or wanting to be inspired by maths or the, as far as the teacher was concerned, none of them would be. What was going on? And I just thought about it and I read everything I could about it, much like Allentown and the fall of the Roman Empire, thinking suddenly this was the most important thing to understand in the world for my own teaching. And I couldn't find any satisfactory explanations and I'm not a, a pedi I'm, I hadn't done a degree in teaching. I, you know, my field's mathematics and computational science. So I thought, probably people know the answer, but I couldn't find the answer anywhere, and I thought, I'm going to find out. So I started interviewing people, and I got people from schools all around the country. 
well, all around the country, in three states, but different states in the country. And I got teachers to nominate students who were really girls, who were really good at maths and really liked maths and really switched on with maths. And I just interviewed them and asked them questions about themselves. And then I came back and said, it wasn't anything to be met. This was the weirdest research you could ever imagine. As a mathematician, it didn't make any sense to me. I was even doing this because I was talking to human beings. And, uh, and <laughs> there was no numbers coming out of this or anything I could weigh up. It was just conversations. But I recorded them. And I recorded them. Six months, record. Six months, record. And they were going through. And some of them, as I mentioned before, I kept interviewing until they got to uni. One of them is over um, in America, she got a, in England. She got a, um, a wonderful scholarship, one of the big Commonwealth scholarships. She's doing some of a PhD, doing something amazing over there. So I've, I've kept in, even in touch with some of them now. She's got children of her own. Um, and it was the best thing for my teaching because I would listen to them and just ask them, what's work? I didn't really care about why it was changing. Actually, I didn't care about that at all. All I cared about was what a teacher could do about it. There's probably some brain psychological thing going on. Who knows? But I wanted to know what teachers could do to change this. Because it should be changed. Because maths is wonderful, and when you enjoy it, it makes you exhilarated and so happy. If you are really good at that, like if you love playing the piano, that joy shouldn't be taken away from you. And I felt it was being taken away from them. I'm not saying they should do maths, but they should have the option to do it, because it is so joyful. So. Listening to students over all those years, and I, then I had my own children, and then I got given a thousand people to teach in first year computing. And things, you know, I, I never wrote up the research. <laughs> but I have, sitting in a box, several boxes actually, hundreds and hundreds of hours of things. So in some sense, the research completely failed because um, I have no idea how to even turn it into a paper or anything. But in another sense, the research was the most profound thing I ever did because I couldn't help but be changed as a researcher as I heard all these stories from the students. It suddenly occurred to me that the students were human and the teachers that were having an impact on their lives, and these are a huge range of girls over a huge range of families and cultures and races and social statuses and all sorts of things, private schools, selective schools, that's... It's the same story was just happening over and over again, that the teachers that were having an impact were the ones that cared and related to them as, they didn't even have to care, but the ones that related to them as humans, the ones the girls felt there was a human connection with, the ones that didn't treat the girls like ball bearings. I was at a talk recently where a guy in charge of NAPLAN was talking. He was talking about the new NAPLAN coming out. And he started his slide with, he said, with the whole pictures of ball bearings. And he said, this is what you guys think NAPLAN Think student people think students are like ball bearings, but we actually think they're like this. And he put up a slide of flowers, and then he gave his talk, which was an entirely, I must say, ball bearing talk. <laughs> and so there was one slide of flowers, sort of apologising. And I was speaking after him, and I thought someone's got to call him out, because <laughs> Naplan is just so wrong. All those ideas behind it are just so evil. Um, so. It, but it, it can't be rude to someone, a fellow, fellow speaker at a conference, but it's wrong. And it's like when a taxi driver is racist, you think, I don't want to be rude to him, but he can't say that. <laughs> so what I did was a bit weak, but in my talk, I just referred to students as ball bearings every time I mentioned them. I said, oh, and then I, I got some ball bearings and I did this with them. So, that, so, 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 so students aren't ball bearings. That's really the thing I learned from interviewing all these students, that... What we need to do as teachers is just think of students as people like us. You are my daughter, you are my father, you are my sister, you're my aunt, you're my neighbour, you're me. We're just people. And once you start thinking like that, it's this completely, it stops you being scornful and angry. And when, you, when you've got an educational decision to make in your class design or in how you're going to present something in the class, it makes everything so clear. You suddenly think, well, they're people, you know, so how would I treat my friends? How would I talk to their equals? They're like me, they're smarter than me, They'll, some of them will be better at me at this, some will be better at that. They'll all be amazing in all these different ways. They are flowers. And once you start thinking like that, it just changes your teaching. And really, you don't have to... People often say, oh, what are your tips? And what strategy do you do in this situation? What strategy do you do in that situation? And absolutely, they're all valid questions to ask, and you can work out all those things. But I think really the most important thing is to understand the generating process that leads to those particular tips happening, which is, and I'm sure all teachers... And you're, you're, um, Mark, you're a primary school teacher. Is that right? Oh, you're a teacher of people that will teach in primary school. Well, if you watch primary school teachers, the effective ones just treat their students as humans. It's just so clear. If you walk into a primary school class, and I've been to many, you can see the difference between the two. All right, Jeff, slide. So 
so I have two things left to say, and I'm going to spend two and a half minutes on each of them. One of them is rainbow. I want to tell you an anecdote from my own growing up about learning. I reflect a lot on learning. I was standing there hosing the car. I was in primary school. I'm washing the car for my dad. Shh, I've got it set to a sort of fine spray. I'm doing something to the car. I'm stuffing around, blowing around the lawn or something like that. And suddenly I notice there's a rainbow in this water. And it's not a normal rainbow. It's like a sideways rainbow. And I'm going, what? And I'm doing more. And then I go, oh, hang on. I can make it a, a normal rainbow here. And, oh, it's like, and I'm playing. And I go, holy moly. Oh, well, so first of all, wow, it's a rainbow. It's a meter away from me. Suddenly a whole lot of rainbows. I've never questioned them. Suddenly I realize it's like in the water. A rainbow's things to do with water. It's in the rain. I normally think a rainbow comes after the rain. But is a rainbow because it's still raining where I'm seeing the rainbow. I didn't even know there was a property that had a location. I just thought it was like an op... I'm going, wow. And then this thing, and then it's a circle. And I'm thinking, this rainbow's a circle. And then I go, are all rainbows circles? I thought they were like that. Maybe if you could cut away the earth, there'd be a whole... I'm going, wow. And I'm going like this. And then I'm thinking, why a circle? Why should it be a circle? It doesn't make any sense that it's a circle. And now I know circles like have two dimensions. They have a center and have a radius, and that fully describes a circle. Everything else is a symmetry. Back then, I didn't really know, but I was just, I didn't know that, but I was just thinking, what is it that makes it a circle? And I was just thinking, if I move, and the rainbow moved with me. And then I said, which bit moves? And, I'm, and eventually, I worked out if my eyes move, or if my brain, but I thought it was an optical property. So it's something to do with the location of the rainbow has something to do with the location of my eyes. There's a relationship between me and the rainbow. So different people in different spots are probably seeing different rainbows. I'm going, wow! And I'm just doing this, and then I'm going, rainbow, rainbow, rainbow. And then I think, so why is it, cir why is it a circle? Why is it not less? And I'm just thinking, I'm thinking, and then I have this flash of inspiration, I think, and I look at the spot in the center of the circle, and I draw a line to my bit between my eyes, and I look behind me, and there is the sun. And I thought that's what I was going to see. And I still get shivers now. I was just... <sighs> that was learning. I have never forgotten that moment. That was more profound than any class I've sort of ever had in my whole life. So learning is not hard to do. Teaching should create environments where people can do that sort of learning. They long for it, it's exciting, we want to understand the world around us or accounting or whatever it is they have to learn. <laughs> they want to know it, that's why they're there. We just have to create an environment where they can discover it and have these experiences. I could have got a million multiple choice questions on rainbows, they could have made it boring as hell in primary school telling me how rainbows work and giving me a project to do at home on rainbows and made me hate rainbows forever. But somehow, if you can create an environment where people discover and work things out for themselves and just appreciate the beauty, you know, this is learning. So for me, teaching creates experiences like this. And the last thing to say in my remaining two and a half... <laughs> Thank you. I mean, it's these hospitals. I'm really interested in doctors. There's power structures in, structures in hospitals. One of my daughters... Who's, is she here? She's not here. But um, one of my daughters has been to hospital recently. I sat with her overnight, and I realized they treated her terribly. They treated her with scorn. She was unimportant. And I realized from watching the whole hospital structure, and I have many friends who are doctors and live in and are powerful doctors, some of them, and less powerful. I realized the doctors, are, uh, hospitals are a hierarchy of power. And the senior doctors treat the other people like scum or are certainly more powerful than the nurses. And, blah, 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 blah. and at the bottom are the patients. So we're at this hospital, and I just realized, looking around the hospital from a systems point of view, everything has been designed for the convenience of the people in the power structure. And my daughter was kept awake all night because the nurse's station was nearby and they were chatting and they didn't give a damn. The hospital wasn't set up to be fantastic for my daughter. It was set up to be convenient so they can get to people in a hurry, so they can essentially be a production line. So you can jam a lot of people in, they can get uniform standardized care, that everything works conveniently and nicely, and the most important person was a doctor and everyone had to fit in with him, and my daughter kept being woken up when she was just getting well-needed sleep because it was convenient for the doctor to see at that instant. Now, this all makes sense. I'm not saying it doesn't make sense, just like the way unis are structured makes sense. It's an efficient use of resources and so on and so on. But really, the way a hospital is structured 
is not for the patients. It's entirely structured for this power hierarchy. And how the patients is treated is sometimes quite terribly. And it just kept striking me as I was going through the hospital. This is a university, or this is a school. This is the same thing. You think a school is there for the students? It's not, it's there for the teachers. You think a university is there for the students? It's not really there for the students. So, I mean, it should be, but the way we've set it up, it's not. So there's, I'm talking with older doctors about this all the time, and I'm really interested in doctors that have retired and gone to hospital themselves. And the standard thing you find is they are horrified. And they start saying things about how, if only I'd known this, I'd have changed things. This is not good. You know, this is terrible for patients. It's not leading to good medical outcomes or optimal medical outcomes to treat patients like this. It's not good for wholeness and wellness. And they're having this realization too late because they get old and crusty and sick and have to go to hospital after they've lost their power and after they've been doctors. But here's the crazy thing. We all go to school first. Teachers get to experience bad teaching first, but we still propagate it. I think it's got to be an easy change once we make this realisation. Once you watch how your children are taught and you see the good and bad teaching they experience, once you reflect on your own good and bad teaching, we actually are now in the position, we've all gone to school. We've all hopefully had a good teacher. So, we have no excuse. And closing on two quotes in my minus two seconds. Uh, this is the one I always say. You've probably heard me say it many times, but I'm so moved by this. If you want to build a ship, don't drum up people to collect wood and don't assign them tasks and work, but rather teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. This is teaching. And in homage to James Baldwin, he didn't actually say this, I've paraphrased it, um, the future of UNSW or the future of a university or the future of a teaching institution is precisely as bright or as dark as the future of its students. I believe students and humanity is what needs to drive good teaching and good teaching is needed for a good world. So that's all I had to say. Thank you very much. Troublemakers? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, I'm interested, I know you might not want to talk about it, it might be unpopular, but the trimesters. What's oh, you want to talk about trimesters? So, well, I can talk about general principles, which is... There's so many levels to talk about that. So I think we're going to have them, and I think we can make them work. We're clever people. We can make things work. The two issues that are really interesting about trimesters are I think we let the students down in the way we went about doing it. I don't think there was enough of a collaboration approach there. But I think we can make it work. I apologise for that because it wouldn't have made you feel good. It wouldn't have made you feel you're important to us. The challenge, I think, with trimesters, though, is interesting. Trimesters, if you're not involved, means we're shortening our terms, so our courses are all shorter in duration, though perhaps they'll be as long in face-to-face -face hours if it's more intense each week or something like that. That child learning to walk, is that what made you think about this when I was showing you? Yeah. That's something that takes time. Learning a fact... You just need hours. If you're talking about face-to-face -face hours and study hours, that tells you how many facts you can learn and memorise at your memorisation rate. But that's the lowest level of what we call Bloom's taxonomy of, of, of learning, you know, knowing stuff. Um, what we want at a university is for people to change, and that takes time. That takes elapsed time. We saw that with the child. Even if we'd given it a perfect lesson the first time about how to walk, it still would have fallen over. If you're trying to learn the piano, if you're trying to do anything, you have to train your whole way of thinking, you have to change almost who you are as a person to be a guitarist or to do any of these things. So, 10 weeks for a course, in my discipline, it's difficult as I watch the students change as they're going from hackers or not being able to program and frightened into competent programmers. It's very difficult to get that transformation of a person in 10 weeks. 
So the responsibility on us as an institution is we are going to have to look beyond courses now. We're now going to have to think properly about sequences of courses because skills, and, and it's, this isn't a necessarily a bad thing because although you can learn how to program in 14 weeks or 13 or 12, um, there are some skills that take even longer than that, like learning how to communicate or good, do good teamwork or um, you know, all sorts of things like that. Um, medicine does that quite well. We, in my faculty engineering, still keep trying to put everything into a course. And there are some skills that ex I think take multiple courses. I often call them golden threads because they run through your whole degree or they run over a period of time. We could get away with just thinking at a course level, Lego lock like in the past. Um, I think if we really do want to change people in profound ways and we've only got 10 week semesters, then we need to think about things that extend between courses or that live outside of courses. And that's an educational design challenge for us and I hope you keep pushing us on it. Um, I think really the main problem with 10 week semesters is just been the way it happened wasn't ideal and when the students got upset, you know, I'm, I'm a dad, actually some of my children are here, sometimes I do things in the wrong way and I boss them around and I don't listen and sometimes when I, they get upset it takes me a while to notice they're upset. You know, we, everyone's just humans. I believe we're trying to deal with it honourably and well now. I think the transition will be okay. I'm not frightened about the change because actually change is good. Hopefully, I'm hoping it'll lead to a revision of a lot of courses that are terrible. But, um, so I'm not frightened of change, but I, uh, so it's an opportunity which could be seized or dropped. But I, I do wish we'd, I think it was relationship damaging and I hope we're going about fi fixing that up now. Is that an okay answer? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, thanks for the talk, Richard. Yeah. Um, something that stuck with me the most was the rainbow story, I guess, uh, yes. of you looking at a rainbow. And I think what's <clears throat> interesting with that is do you think that, like, I don't know how old you were, if that was just last week or if it was when you were 10 or... or <laughs> 10, 10. 10, right. Yeah, so, um, I mean, if you get 100 uh, 10-year-olds and they were all having that experience, how many of them would make that connection that the sun was behind them to see that? And so in, in your experience, what is it that's... Is it just you in that position that's allowed that or what fosters that learning? I think that's a really profound question. That was a personal learning experience. So if we go back to the course, we've got 100 people, they've all got to move lockstep, they've got to have the same realisation at the same time and how teachers get away with doing that is we have, you know, prompted reflection and we say, have you noticed this? And if you still haven't got an activity sheet, point it out by the end. Uh, and that's sort of cheating. I mean, I think these, I think everyone gets different inspirations at different times in different ways. So I. I don't think 100 people would have got it, but I don't think, I think there's things that they would have got that I wouldn't have got in other situations. What I, I'm not saying how do we mass produce this experience, though obviously that is the question to be answered. Um, and it's a hard question. I'm saying we need to have this experience. I, I mean, I just noticed that there is this need, that your education should be peppered with. I had lots of examples like that. Um, actually, I only had time to give one. But I think those experiences are what makes an education the things you remember are the things you've built or done yourself or the insights or th things you've had yourself. N nothing, no inspiration in my life has ever come from a worksheet or from doing homework or from an exam. I actually, one exam once I got the most amazing idea from. So it is possible. Can I share? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Richard, thank you yes. for a very nice okay. talk. It's oh, Rakesh. Hey, Richard. Hi. And I wanted to offer three little comments on different bits of what you said. Um, one was, how come having suffered bad teaching, we perpetuate it? Yes. I think part of that involves the sort of reward structures we've got. Yeah. And it is good to see that some of the reward structures changing. Part of it involves the community of learners, yeah. the community of teachers and learners. We're barely getting to first base on that. We have a lot of room for improvement on, on how we share expertise. And I think some of it comes from events like this, but there's a huge element of preaching to the converted in events like this, and making yeah. that happen more broadly is hard. And the second thing is the point you made, since I work in medicine, I'm very conscious of what you said about how some things need to develop over time. I think one of our huge problems here is the pick from a menu, a menu that's longer than most Chinese restaurants to design what constitutes your degree program. It often has very little articulation that makes any sense. Yeah. And it, the time has to come 
for us to take a programmatic view of what happens. Yeah. It'll still be a form of industrial design and production line um, output, but at least it will have coherence, which at yeah. the moment it doesn't seem to. And the last comment I'd like to make is, I honestly cannot remember the name of the primary school teacher who said this, but I believe she died in the Challenger disaster. And oh. the line that she produced She's was amazing. one that stayed with me. I touch the future, I teach. Yeah. And I thought that was one heck of a good explanation of why it matters. Thank you, thank you. She's a remarkable woman, and I'm gonna find out more about that quote, thank you. Yeah, I agree with all your three observations, thank you. Don't, please don't give the mic to this guy. Um, I'm, I'm not a teacher, I'm actually, I came to this talk, somebody told me about it after hearing you in conversation. Yes. And I agreed with every single thing you were saying because I'm interested in yes. what's happening in schools. My daughter's grown up yes. and I would love to do something to change the experience for, it's a, it's a small thing I'd like to do, yes. change the experience of all children in schools. Um, all this money that's gone into education just now, we've got the same teachers. I mean, can you make any comments at all on that? I mean, it's, it, it's propping up this industrial model Yes. That I agree with you is, 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 is finished, but is being yes. uh, prolonged. Thank you. Yeah, I have three comments. One is, I'm disappointed you agree with everything I said. <laughs> <laughs> and I will try harder next time. <coughs> um, I, whenever I have a course, I try normally to have one of my tutors, I try and have the tutors with the same idea and value sets as me. Okay. Oh, good. <laughs> One thing. Yes. Okay. Brexit. I'm English, as you can see yes. from the yes. The reason that people were voting for Brexit, yes. and you said it was the educated against the non-educated. Yes. I'm from Oxford, by the yes. way, so I'm speaking yes. here. Is that the education, that the, the educated people are not very educated, but they think they're educated, and they're sitting on the head, top of the heads of all the people, the other people, and they said, fuck this. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so okay. Define education. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, look, I had no idea that Oxford turned out such foul-mouthed people. But um, uh, uh, that's probably true. It's probably a deeper thing than that. So perhaps that was a bad example. So I'm glad. I, I'm glad. That was the, you know, when you make a Turkish rug, you have to. It's blasphemous. Yeah. Um, so oh, I was just going to say, when I employ tutors, I always like to have one tutor who's going to be a troublemaker or who disagrees with me or something. I just think in life, I'm blessed to have three daughters who are troublemakers. I just think... It's very important we don't all sit around agreeing with each other, so um, thank you, thank you. Uh, the second point was um, that you, uh, your daughter's gone through education, you've noticed these problems and you want to do something about it, and I just wanted to say thank you. Because it's very easy to be a, an observer, and in fact, when I first noticed how bad maths teaching was, and I was just going on and on about it, my wonderful wife said, who wasn't my wife at that stage, you complain a lot, don't you? <laughs> and, and I suddenly realised, I should do something about it. And so it sounds like you are, and I, I think we need to. And, and the third question was about teachers. So the third point was about teachers. I actually think it's funny. The normal path that people go through, I think, that I went through and I've seen other teachers go through it, is you, you get angry with the system, you realise there's bad teaching, you get angry, and at some point you start getting angry at the people who aren't, you think, teaching well or caring well. And you start getting angry and you start calling them bad teachers and you start thinking we need to get rid of bad teachers. And you and it just struck me one day that I was treating my colleagues in the same way that I hate when they treat the students. When they say this is a bad student and this is someone who doesn't understand and this is someone who... And actually my colleagues are all humans as well and they probably all do want to do the right thing and for a whole range of human and personal reasons they're not doing it and they might be frightened to do it or they might... You know, if you get negative student feedback all the time, you start saying it's not important, you know, fox and the grape sort of thing. So I don't think we necessarily need to get rid of the bad teachers. I think the they're salvageable. The but the, in school, uh, but the industrial model of school, school. yes. And nothing's going to change when the standards are going down, the more money's going in, but it's the teaching. Yeah, so I think we need to change the teaching. I'm just saying I don't know that we have to change the teachers. We, I think we need more and we need more you know, they need more exemplars and we probably need more seeds and things like that. But I think, um, I think we've got every country, every school I walk into, I just is populated with amazing people that, that, that inspire me. But I also do see lazy people. 
And, but maybe that's salvageable. And I see scornful people and rude people and mean people. And, and they should go. And, and, and sometimes I almost want to say to... I, I never have, to my shame, sometimes I want to find a parent of a child if I'm observing at a school and say, send your boy to another school. He needs to leave. And I've never seen it. So there are sometimes bad yeah, teachers. Yeah, 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 yeah. Some schools, I've had some yep. schools, but they but, call that, but, they call that model. Yeah. And so I think the model needs to change and all of our voices. All of our voices and examples and teachers breaking free. And I, it's a revolution we need. How do you change things? It's a cultural change. I've actually started speaking to anthropologists recently because I understand culture and I realise this isn't a changing of practice. This is a changing of culture and I need to understand how cultures change. I need to understand how Bethlehem steel... I need to, how do you bring about a changing culture? And that's sort of what I'm trying to do in my new role. Thank, sorry, was there one last one? Yeah. Oh, yeah, oh. One, one for the troublemakers. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Richard. Um, I, there's lots of things I could say, but yes. I won't say them because there's not enough time. One thing I will say is that I love the rainbow story. And in fact, I teach adults. Yes. Most of my students, in fact, I would say all of them, are graduates of universities. Some of them have PhDs. Yes. Uh, one of them was the chancellor of the ANU. So, yes. so I, I get to teach some pretty high-powered people in yes. interesting places. Yes. None of them know that the colours in the rainbow are upside down. Yes. None of them know that when two people stand side by side, they don't see the same rainbow. Yes. They've never had the experience. Yes. Now, I think that you spoke about teaching and setting up environments where students can learn. I think it has to go one step further than that. We have to set up environments where the students will discover and will understand and not just learn. Oh, I think we have yes. to pursue understanding. Yeah. What I do in my classes, I try and set them up so that there are plenty of aha moments in the yeah. class. Yeah. And they're the experiences that the students remember. Yeah. They don't remember the stuff I teach them. And I don't want them to. I want them to think about it, understand it, and I want the information or the knowledge to live in them. Yes. And to do that, I think, to strive to do that, you've got to be a particular type of teacher. And that goes all the way back to where and how we teach our teachers to be teachers. And that comes back to universities in a way. I think the way that in universities, the way we teach teachers to become teachers, or the way we teach students to become teachers, is just as formulaic and production line and, and, and as, as we don't want it to be. Yes. Unfortunately, there's costs and politics and everything else goes into it, and you're right, it's a culture change. We've only been doing it for 10,000 years. We're still practicing. Hopefully, we'll get it right one day. But there has to be this change. And I think uh, it's not a case of getting rid of the teachers. It's a question of training our teachers to be better teachers. And that's got to start in universities. So it comes back to us as university people that we have to make sure that we make sure the next, te next generation of teachers is, is the way we want them to be. They've got to go out yes. wanting to be the kinds of teachers that you are advocating. Thank you. Over to you for comment. Um, only super fast. Um, yeah. Um, you, you both are saying the same thing, in a sense, that we need to change. How do we go about changing it? And I don't know the answer, and you've suggested some very good answers, but I do know we need to find an answer. And by we, I mean each and every one of us individually has a responsibility to think about this. And we're smart people. We've got to be able to do it. So just seeing that we need the answer is good. And we just try stuff like crazy. And your comment about the ANU <coughs> Chancellor being an idiot. I, I, I don't know what to say. <laughs> okay, no, thanks. No, yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, We'd better stop before yeah, we get Yeah, we might stop yeah. because we've got some refreshments downstairs for you all and you can continue the conversations downstairs. I think the fact that the, the, you know, this conversation has gone on for uh, an extended period of time, I think is actually just showing us that Richard has actually hit uh, of, you know, the points that we actually want to talk about, the things that actually mean something to us. I also think, Richard, you've exemplified what I said earlier about a passion. I think we saw that passion uh, today. I think that's a very real passion. I also am so pleased that we've actually been able to provide these opportunities for our outstanding educators to be able to engage us in a conversation. And I'm so pleased, Richard, as well, this wasn't a lecture, this was a conversation, so thank you very much for that. And I think the other uh, thing that has come out of tonight, uh, Richard, if I could summarise it, is that if we want to engage someone's mind, we also have to engage their heart. And so thank you for uh, bringing back this very deep 
understanding that actually education is about people and it's about the teacher and the student actually both behaving as people as we would like. So thank you very much and let us all thank Richard for his conversation. And you may all continue the conversation downstairs over some refreshments. You're all welcome to stay for that. Thank you.